So you, you say you, know, you were in pain. I mean, do you remember what actually happened to you during that missing time? I have bits and pieces. I do not have a clear linear memory of what happened, but I do have recollection of being inside that thing. Uh, as far as our injuries, we were burned. I, I was burned to a crisp. I, I had, it was like the worst sunburn you could possibly imagine short of blistering. I never blistered, but I was burned on the soles of my feet, under my arms. I mean, literally every inch of my body. And I felt like I had sand in my eyes. I found out later at the hospital, I had what's characterized as arc welders burn or flash burn. It's um, what an arc welder would receive if he didn't protect his eyes during, during welding. Uh, and that's a very painful thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We, um, we were afraid to move out of the tent. The uh, tent gave us cover at least. I felt like if I, if I walked out of the tent or even ran out of the tent that I'd be vulnerable. I didn't want to be exposed. At least I was hidden underneath that thin layer of canvas. But Toby was right. He said, man, we got to get out of here. He says, you know, I think they're all gone. Let's just get out of here. So with a little encouragement from him, that's what we did. We bolted and ran to my car and we got in and we drove back to the base. Uh, when we got back to the base, our wives uh, took us both to the hospital and we were admitted to the hospital. I didn't know it at the time, but we were uh, classified as acutely ill due to dehydration. I remember on the drive back being so thirsty. Never in my life had I been so thirsty. And I just could not get enough to drink. Uh, my friend Toby was hurt much worse than I was. And he was kind of curled into a fetal position in the front seat of my 66 Chevy that had the, the large bench seats. Mm -hmm. And he was hurting. He really was. And he was in no condition to drive a car. So the doctor came in and said, uh, and you know, we both worked at the hospital squadron, so we knew everyone there. We were like, it was like family. And a doctor that I knew came in and said, what happened to you guys? Now, you know, I knew that if I told him, and even if Toby backed up my story, if we told him we saw a UFO the size of a medical building, they would have sent us for a psych evaluation. That would have happened, no question in my mind. So we, we opted to just cut out that part. Right. We went camping, we went to bed, we woke up sick as dogs. And that was our story. Um, park rangers, I guess, during the night or sometime in the early morning, while we were driving back, must have found that, that uh, chain down on the road and went in to investigate and they found our campsite. And we left everything there. So we had, you know, mm -hmm. Toby's backpack with his camera in it. Uh, the backpack had his name written on it in an in indelible marker uh, with, along with the phone number and uh, his address at the base. So they knew we were from the air base. And they, the Rangers must have called the air base and said, a couple of your guys have set up a camp out here. It looks like they plan to come back because they left everything here. Well, because of the suspicious nature of the campsite and the fact that we had these, these um, bizarre injuries, uh, the Office of Security Police and then its investigative branch, the Office of Special Investigations, got involved and came to question us. Another curious thing that happened was the hospital, the hospital commander, squadron, the hospital commander, the base commander, and two guys that I think were OSI in blue business suits came into my room. The hospital commander spoke to me uh, and we had a pretty good relationship. We could have a conversation, but this was a strictly business. And he says, Sergeant Double, I should have had no contact with Sergeant Tobias, not in any way, shape or form. That means no phone calls, no verbal communication. No notes passed. You're to give him nothing. He's to give you nothing. No contact means not through third parties. They wanted to see if your story's corroborated. 
They wanted to keep us away from one another. They did not want us to get together uh, because I think two witnesses would be more effective than one. Uh, and I've heard from a couple other people that had similar experiences while on active duty that that was routine. In fact, we were not only ordered to have no contact, uh, my enlistment was coming up. I was, this was June of 77. I was due to get out in 79. So I didn't have much time left. Toby had a little more. And they cut orders for him, uh, PCS they call it, and, and he shipped out to Japan very fast. And my third night in the hospital, I knew I would be going home the next day. And I was feeling somewhat better, but I kept the lights off for my comfort. And they just run bags of fluid through me. And once they got me rehydrated, I felt somewhat better. And when my nurse came in, she was going to give me an injection for pain. And two guys in business suits followed her in. Not the two guys that were in the hospital when I spoke with the commanding officer. Two different guys. And these guys were cops. I mean, they, they were plainly cops. And the one gentleman that was in charge, a guy maybe in his late 40s, early 50s, uh, showed me his credentials uh, that he was and his badge. And I note, noted that he was a major in rank. And uh, he was accompanied by a captain who likewise flashed his, his identification in my direction. And they sat down and interrogated me. And the nurse, the, he asked the nurse, if that's going to sedate Sergeant Lovelace, it's going to have to wait until we ask him some questions and shut the door on your way out, which was rude. And there was no, no reason for it to be rude. But, you know, in retrospect, all of what went on was theater, you know, for the purpose of intimidating me, which, you know, I was 22. I had never been in trouble a day in my life. And, uh, I, I was very much intimidated. And my first thought was, oh my God, we burned the forest down or something. So he said that and he said, well, you know, you boys left your campsite there. The only reason I think you, know, you would do that is because maybe you got yourselves a little marijuana plot out there. Is that, what, is that what's going on here? Is you guys grow mm -hmm. some marijuana out there? And I thought, oh my God, what if by happenstance somebody did have some marijuana out there? I mean, active duty in 1977, that would have meant a uh, prison sentence. So I had a very harsh interrogation, but I stuck to the story, went to bed, got up sick, came home. And the captain left. The nurse finally gave me my injection, and it was just me and the major in the room. And he took his hand, and he held the door shut. And my bed was right there next to the door. And he bent down next to my ear. And he had this Louisiana accent, kind of like Calvin Parker, if you've ever spoken or heard yeah, him yeah. speak. So in this accent, he said, son, I know, and you know, you two knuckleheads stumbled onto something out there. And I think you know what I mean. And I didn't reply. And he says, oh, yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> and he turns off this tough guy affect facially and kind of looks like a human being again. And he said to me, son, all I want is the film of the pic and the pictures that you took of it. And I want your camera. And this will all go away and everything will be just fine. Wow. Yeah, wow. No, I left my good camera at home which is inexplicable, but it didn't matter. Toby had a camera in his backpack. The thought of taking a picture of this thing never crossed our minds. And I lived to take pictures back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another example of how they, they had control over us. Um, so uh, were these guys really cops? Absolutely, they were. They were. They were indeed. They had valid... Uh, Badges and uh, and uh, it sounded like they didn't want this thing to get out and people to see it. I think that's exactly right. I think that 
you know, I had a reputation within the squadron of being an amateur photographer. Matter of fact, I'd made a promise to the hospital commander that I would take Ansel Adam quality black and white prints uh, that, that will be stunning. And I said, I'll, I will frame one for your office. And he said, well, I'll hold you to that, Sergeant. Uh, so we had a good rapport, but... Uh, hmm. So everyone in the, in the squadron knew that I went down there with the intention of photographing wildlife. So I guess the, uh, the OSI assumed that, uh, yeah. that I had taken pictures of it. Okay, so um, what, happened, what happened since then? I mean, you talk about you know, decades of trauma. I mean, what kind of trauma did you experience? Within a few weeks, uh, well, well, the trauma was the physical injury for the first couple of weeks. But after that, I started experiencing nightmares. Uh, Did they I have the same them, theme? Were they themed the same? They were, they were themed the same. And I, I thought it would be wise to journal them. And I did. And I documented them. And I could see that some of them were repetitive. As a matter of fact, it was about the same five dreams that I'd experienced over and over again. And I've experienced those five dreams um, a lot over the years, less, lesser, you know, that was 43 years ago. Uh, 